Welcome to Disability Empowerment Now. I'm your host, Keith Mavidigansini. Today I'm talking to actor Dad Lewis Edwards, who played Remy in the Broadway musical How to Dance in Ohio. Desmond, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Uh, doing great, actually. As you know, I've seen the show six times, including the Broadway reunion uh, concert, which we'll talk about later. But oh first, my gosh, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, but first, let's go back to the very beginning. How did you find out? out about the musical and what was the process like auditioning? Oh my gosh. So I was actually 17 years old uh, when I first got the audition stuff. I first got casted. Um, I was living in Orlando, Florida at the time and I was doing a summer camp at the Dr. Phillips Center uh, for the Performing Arts as part of their education program. Um, and the summer camp was called Take It From the Top. And um, Jacob happened to be there as one of the faculty for the uh, for the camp. Uh, Jacob is our composer of How to Dance in Ohio. And we knew that he was working on a musical, but we didn't know what it was at all. Um, you know, he just was like, you know, kind of going off to like, you know, meetings and whatever. Um, and, you know, I had confided in him that I was autistic because, you know, he was, he was teaching us the music and such. And I was like really interested. I was really, I was so annoying. I was sitting at the front of the class, you know, raising my hand at everything. And, you know, I was like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm autistic. And he's like, that's nothing to be ashamed of. Like, you shouldn't be apologizing for that. And it was the very last day. It was a Friday when we did our final, like, you know, um performance like you know our big showcase and Jacob came up to me and he was like I think you'd be great for a role in the musical that I'm working on and I was like oh my gosh so then you know we met up for coffee in New York uh and you know he sent me the casting info and I remember sending in a self-tape a callback and I got casted at 17 years old and we did our first 20 an hour reading um, when I was still in high school. I actually missed uh, part of my high school's production that uh, the spring, the fall production that year. Uh, so yeah, that's how I got cast it and stuff. It's very interesting to think that this story is based on a documentary because I'm trying to remember other documentaries that are turned into musicals. And for the life of me, I cannot remember uh, another one off the top of my head. What would you like watching the documentary and meeting the participants in the documentary. Yeah, so I didn't actually watch the documentary until like later on in the process. Um, I'd say it was after like one of our workshops, so I didn't actually like, you know, watch the documentary because I wanted all of my acting choices to feel authentic. I didn't want to like, you know, try to copy somebody else you know but um it was wow it was incredible to meet the participants I actually didn't meet Remy in person until the Broadway run um our opening night when everybody came on stage um but I did get to meet real life Caroline and Jessica as well as their mothers Johanna and um you know I forget her name Johanna and what was it? You get the point. Yeah. You get the point. Yeah. 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 But um, 
yeah so it was it was a lot of fun it was it was so much fun um it was also like it, it was an honor truly to see like how excited they were to see that like you know we were playing them they like you know it was it was just so cool so cool how was it meeting the cats for the first time and how quickly did you guys bond yeah so we met at our plan our reading and then we had i think there was another we knew that we were going to syracuse then we had another workshop prior to Syracuse I think that was sometime in June of 2021 I believe or 2022 I'm not sure and then um yeah it was 2022 yeah because I had graduated um and we kind of knew each other like we were just like oh we're gonna have some fun but it wasn't until Syracuse that we really like you know got to bond and everything um because we were living in such close quarters with each other like we were living in college dorms like across the hall from each other like neighbors like we went to the we went to the New York State Fair together like we did a bunch of like outings like you know we had to carpool to like you know go get groceries so like you know living wow. in such close quarters yeah, exactly exactly yeah. so wow. like <laughs> yeah living in such close quarters with each other and stuff like that really like we became friends like we became like besties during that Wow, so it must have been easy to transfer that close relationship to the stage then. Yeah, we actually, <laughs> it was so funny because we actually got a little bit of like a no, we got a little bit in trouble because basically the characters on stage are supposed to be like, you know, not so close with each other, but no. we we're so close with each other that like the characters were like, you know, super close and like touchy with each other, but they weren't supposed to be like, you know, <laughs> so that was a little bit of a note that we got, which was, which is really funny, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I've told you that before at the end of the show, the characters, and now the actors, seem very close-knit. And so the characters seem very much like a family. And given everything you just told me, it's no wonder that the actors very much. Uh, so, what would you like Huawei opening night, knowing that your real life counterparts were watching you from the stage? Because this is literally based on a true story and what would that like oh my gosh it was so nerve-wracking because we're like is are they gonna like it like ding, ding, you know ding, right and exactly <laughs> exactly and like you know it was it was so it was so surreal truly because you know, you're playing a person, but like, you don't actually know this person. You know what I mean? All you see is what was shown in the documentary. And in my case, you know, Remy was only pictured a few times in the documentary in the film. So I didn't really know like who Remy was, you know, but, you know, I, I just like, I didn't get to see any of their faces, but from what I was told by Remy's, um, mother or grandmother just family was that he during my song my big number nothing at all that he was crying and mouthing the words to the song even though he didn't even know it but you know he was he was yeah it was just it was incredible truly yeah it sounds like it and i mean as an avid theater girl, I watched the documentary actually after the Broadway run closed. Yeah, I recommend that people do that. I recommend that people see the Broadway show first before they watch the documentary. 
yeah, well, uh, it's a good thing I did that, uh, could it, it would so eye opening and it, it would like there's one major plot point that Rebecca and Jacob added. But other than that, the only thing mentioned from the documentary is Jacob's score. It, it's really like you took that, you took that, you took that. Ah, that's where that comes in. It, it's like it's so mind blowing how faithful Rebecca and Jacob were to the overall source material. Talk more about how people reacted to seeing it. Yeah, so the documentary is definitely from, like, 2015, you know. Actually, and... it was recorded in 2013. And oh, released. my gosh. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Because uh, I, I'm really retentive like that. No, I get that. I yeah. get that. No, yeah, it was recorded in 2013, and it's very obvious by, like, you know, the culture surrounding disability. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But, like, you know, it's it's important to, like, stay true to the source material, but also, you know, truly think about how things have changed since then in our, you know, 10 years, 11 years now since then. Um, and, you know, our, our conversations around disability and around autism and the new updated terms that we use now and you know thankfully with like the the hard work of our accessibility team who just won a drama desk award yesterday yeah uh -huh. uh, i saw that uh-huh uh -huh. yeah. yeah but um yeah through their hard work you know now we have our updated you know terms in the show now and you know how differently we talk about autism and disability now compared to when we did in 2013 you know yeah. the use of symbols you know the puzzle piece symbols versus you know the the rainbow infinity sign you know something as simple as that um but yeah it's 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 something that you have to stay true to the source material but also be with the times and be with you know the new conversations that we have surrounding disability Why do you think that Broadway, that now was the moment that Broadway decided, hey, we should really catch up and do that? Because Broadway had had a long ass history of not doing that. And it, it's like if they had tried to do this 10 years ago, let's be honest, they w would have most likely cast the roles with temporarily able-bodied actors who were just acting artistic. Thankfully, yeah. they didn't. But why do you think that now, in the time period we are in, that Broadway wised up and said, yeah, we should really put the zone authentically. Yeah. So I'm not actually sure. I think it was Sammy Cannell, our director's idea to cast 
authentically with autistic actors. But I remember she said this in a few interviews and stuff, but people told her that she wasn't going to be able to do it, that they weren't going to be able to find autistic actors to play these roles. But, you know, they sent out the casting search and got so many people, you know, that, you know, just an, an incredible amount. I want to see hundreds, thousands of autistic people, you know, that, you know, are capable of playing these roles, you know. And with our UK run that's happening uh, next year, there's going to be even more across the sea, you know. Yeah. So many autistic actors that are capable of playing these roles and so many disabled actors that are capable of playing roles that can play roles that should be playing roles. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I do. It, it's, it's very hard for me that the show was very unapologetic about casting the Magnificent Seven ads uh, with autistic actors. And so talk about the process of doing the show over and over and over and over again for the third time because a movie you shoot it for a few months, it's up there, people can buy it. But literally, when the curtain rises, you guys have to pretend like you don't know each other, that the characters don't know each other, and you have to do it faithfully to the third time eight shows a week. How was that process? Yeah, so, you know, it's just a lot of repetition, but also finding new things in every performance. You know, finding, like, you know, really connecting with the beats every performance and, you know, finding something fresh and new every single time you do it, you know, trying out something new, like, you know, taking some risks that are within reason. Um, but, you know, finding something new every single performance to keep it fresh, keep it lively as the show goes on. You know what I mean? Like, you know, staying true to like, you know, the material and staying true to what we've done in the past, but also keeping it fresh and keeping it lively and, you know, trying out new things. And yeah, yeah, I'd say that. Was it hard finding new things, little tweaks to put in the show to make it more lively and uh, not monotonous and repetitive all the time? Uh, kind of, you know, it could have just been something like, you know, like a simple glance at like, you know, a character, like I know that um, Liam and Madison who played Meredith and Drew, you know, they would steal another glance at each other, you know, uh, every single show, they just find like, another way to like look at each other. And, you know, in, you know, my character being the Shaka. one that like, <laughs> yeah. And, Shaka. And, <laughs> yeah. No, but my character being the one that kind of knows what's going on, like, you know, I'd find another moment where I'd like look between them and be like, oh, so that's happening, you know, <laughs> like, you know, so if like somebody happens to be taking a bootleg or something or a video, like they'll find yeah. something new every single time, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are some of the highlighted memories from the cat's door and meeting the fans and seeing how much love and enthusiasm there was rightfully so for this show? 
Oh my gosh. I remember when I got my first piece of fan art. Like that was a highlight for me, my first piece of fan art. And I almost cried. Like I was just like, oh my gosh, you know? And I even hung it up in my dressing room and like, you know, uh, but yeah. And then I guess, oh, there was another time where um, the stage door, you know, we try to make it as accessible as possible, but there was some wheelchair users that couldn't get through and like see us. And I was like, uh-uh, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. This is not what we're doing. And I literally talked to security. I was like, these people need to get up to the front of the stage door. And we did it. And they got up to the front of the stage door. And, you know, there was even like another like power chair user that couldn't get through, even if like, you know, we part of the crowds. And so, you know, we talked to each other, like as each one of us exited the stage door, we'd be like, hey, there's a power chair user on the other side. Make sure you circle around to make sure that they're able to see you. You know, so we really, it was, you know, we wanted, we, we, we definitely had a good time at the stage door, but we also wanted to make sure that we were taking our time with people, you know, and even like another time there was somebody um, who was using an AAC device yeah. and, you know, I was in the middle of talking to them and people, like other people were trying to like rush, like, you know, butt in the conversation and I could tell the person using the AAC was getting like, you know, frantic and like, you know, you know, uh, uncomfortable. And I was like, honey, I'm talking to you. These other people can wait. You know yeah. what I mean? Like these other people, they can wait like five minutes for me to talk to you because we are in yeah. a conversation right now. Yeah. So, you know, it truly like the stage door was also, you know, a lesson in accessibility as well for not only us, but for audience members and security that was there, you know? Yeah, that's a uh, very important and unfortunately not often thought about if the so the UK production is going live next year. If there ever is a movie and this it's hypothetical but it has been done before successfully transferring do you think you and the cats will come back i'm not sure i can't answer that um yeah. i can't answer for everybody i know that we're not going to be in the uk production us actors yeah. um which is an excellent opportunity for more oh, yes. people to be seen absolutely yeah, but in terms of a movie or something, I'm not sure. I can't answer for everybody else. I think I would like to. I think it would be cool, but, yeah. you know, you never know. You never know. It depends on what I'm doing at the moment, but, you know, if there was a movie or a TV show, like, I would, yeah. you know, that would be that would be cool, you know. Because from a fan's perspective, hypothetic, like, you guys have just finished the movie, Rebecca and Jacob have just written the sequel, and they're in pre-planning on the third. Now, how do you make this a trilogy? I don't know. That's why it's <laughs> called a hypothetical Oh my gosh. <laughs> and a fan geeking out. I'm also going to be interviewing Rebecca and uh, Jacob. But yeah. What would you like reading through the script? the third time what would that table reading like oh my gosh it was so much fun like I think all of us were also like really confused because we didn't know the music yet so we we're just going off like the lyrics <laughs> like we didn't actually know like how the songs went we were just like basically whenever you do a table reading for the first time you were reading the lyrics like you were not singing along you are reading the lyrics so it was like we had to read, today is, today is, today is Monday, today is Tuesday. And like, we didn't know the song. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a part of the humor. That was a part of the humor um, of it all. But, you know, I feel like we could also tell that like, this is going to be a long journey of like, you know, rewrites and like, you know, the source material was great to start with. But we also knew that like, 
a lot of things were going to change and we had to be open to that change which was hard but you know we got through it why would it hard oh my gosh so my song nothing at all was created um i want to say in june of 2022 so right before our syracuse okay. run that song has had the most lyric changes to it and the wow. most like structure changes to it i want to say that that song has had the most lyric changes like oh my gosh like <laughs> and wow. whenever i sing it like i i always think of a different lyric like it's no joke like when i'm velma from scooby-doo i pick up clues so easily or like when i'm apollo creed i am the champion of the ring and like just lyrics that you wouldn't even think of like lyrics that like the rest of like i literally told the rest of the cast like some of the lyrics that have gone through even sammy the director did not know that some of these lyrics existed like wow it like so many lyric changes so many changes like the song structure in general wow the wow <laughs> yeah and so what would you like meeting the creative team working alongside them? And what would you like meeting the accessibility team and working alongside them as well? Oh my gosh. So I was so nervous to meet the rest of the creative team because all I knew was Jacob um from that summer camp but like you know now I had to meet like so many other people but in terms of the accessibility team I remember it used to be just one person it used to be uh Ava um you know as the ASD consultant and then that expanded over the course of you know the production to so many more people um which was so great to see that but no. you know yeah, it was really nerve-wracking at first, but I'm glad that the accessibility team has expanded so much. What do you think it is about this show that made people keep seeing it again and again and again. Like, I saw it six times. I've never done that before, but if you follow Jacob's Instagram, which everyone absolutely should, he, he was highlighting fans who said this is my 20th time, my 30th time. What about this musical do you think hooked people in such a way? Because as an avid musical theater goer, I have never, ever witnessed that kind of devotion before yeah I think it's definitely like people seeing themselves represented for the first time or even seeing like an inkling of like the disability community represented for the first time I think representation and connection is such you know that that really that it's so it's so important except like like you know it's just representation is so important and when people are able to see themselves for the first time in a piece of media like you just want to keep coming back you know what I mean like you know I've watched I've rewatched shows so many times because I, I feel represented in them like you know I have my book of a strange loop uh the musical and I I read through that so many times you know I I listen to the music so much you know it's just like seeing yourself represented is so powerful yeah, I remember uh, going the second and third time even uh, because the soundtrack wasn't out yet. And I was in a panic that maybe you guys wouldn't relate the soundtrack, which now sounds absurd. 
uh, but those songs and those lyrics stick with you. What would you like shooting, well, not only re recording the soundtrack, but also shooting the cover, because the cover is very iconic. In oh, my, my gosh. Opinion. The photo shoot, the photo shoot, the, the photo. Oh, my God. That was, I had the best time. That was my first time ever being photographed. And we had gotten styled. We had gotten our makeup done. We had gotten our hair done. And our photographer, Mark, Mark Franklin, was so great. He was truly so great. And I truly felt like safe in a space because I, I hate taking like photos of myself. Like I've always hated like taking photos of myself. And like up until that point, like I've never seen a photo and like been like, that's me, you know, like that's who I feel like I am inside. And you know, I, I I took one look at the photo when he first like photographed and I I was like, that's me, you know, that's that's who I am. And those photos are truly something special. And it was so funny because like we were taking the photos and like the set when when the seven of us were together, none of us could stop laughing. So like and there was like one like there was like I think it was like one serious photo that we took and that was a photo that was on the outside of the theater. <laughs> that was the only serious photo that we took because we just kept cracking up the entire time. So hypothetically, if there was a sequel. What would you hope it would explore? Oh my gosh. I hope it explores queer people in the autistic community, specifically through the roles of Mel and Remy. Um, you know, Remy, well, my version of Remy being intersex as well. Um, it's really not often that you have actual intersex characters in the media. And so I think it'd be really important to explore the intersection of identities, um, you know, of the autistic people, you know, being a woman, being like, you know, black, you know, being, yeah. you know, anything really, but, um, you know, exploring what that means for autistic people, um, navigating different identities as well. And I also want Remy to find romance, you know? I want, like, yeah. I want there to be, like, a queer romance, you know? Yeah. 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 Speaking of Mel, uh, there's a line, a short scene between Mel and Ashley, Dr. Amigo's daughter, mm -hmm which I always love because it hints at so many possibilities of what happened before. And you kind of get a payoff with reincarnation of this reconciliation between the two. But that moment, always piqued my interest because I'm like tell me more and yeah <laughs> and they don't they don't they can because they have so much more to get to what would it like being part of a ensemble cats will there's no main characters, but there's the main hetero no more romance. But really, there's no main characters. Everyone gets a song. All, almost all of you are in everyone else's songs to some degree. What would the rehearsing like to that? Uh, for that, because again, 
I don't, I can't really recall another musical that is structured that way. Yeah, so luckily for, like, rehearsals, like, our, our team was very, like, you know, if you are called from this time to this time, like, you will be active. Like, you know, they only called us when they needed us, thank God, um, because that would have been very boring. But um, we were only called when we were needed, which was very, very great. Um, you know, our time was used wisely and with care, which I appreciate a lot. But, you know, it was, it was, <laughs> it's fun. But like, you know, the seven of us were called for like everything, you know. Um, but that's just, that's just the part of the job. That's just how it goes. And so, how much did you guys interact with the accessibility team and on a, not a daily basis, but responsive uh, wise, because again, the accessibility team, I think it's the third accessibility team to be attached to a show. Uh, certainly a show like this. So what was that experience like? Uh, and how did that change uh, the dynamics of the work? Yeah, so the accessibility team had like an email and like whenever we had like anything arise, we could literally just email them and they'd get back to us within like an hour. <laughs> like they were on wow. top of it. Like they were on top of it, like truly. Like, and also they did a lot of stuff like behind the scenes, like uh, like Liz Weber, for example, um, one of our assistant stage, like our assistant stage managers, made mood boards for our dressing rooms and made the theater accessible. Like we had mood boards outside of our dressing rooms with like a happy face and like you know, like a mid face and then like a sad face. Like we could like figure out like okay, what's everybody feeling? When can we go to the dressing rooms? We also like whiteboards outside there so we can like write on them and be like, hey, not right now. Um, we also had they also put clocks inside of our dressing rooms so like you know some of us that like struggle with like time and stuff um and Liz also went ahead and put unscented soap in every single bathroom in that theater for us because some of us struggle with scents and stuff yeah Liz put unscented soap like Liz Liz if you are watching this thank you Liz yeah. does not get recognized enough for their yeah. work. Yeah. Truly. Making the theater accessible for the cast and for other people as well. Wow. Wow. So, what got you into acting? And did you ever have the dream of being on Broadway or was it like, wow, I'm now on Broadway. Help me <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. That's so real. That's so real. Oh my gosh. I did not know that I wanted to become an actor, like truly. Like my, I wanted to be like an engineer. Um, I went to an engineering school uh and I did not know I wanted to become an actor um I went through a pretty traumatic puberty <laughs> as an intersex person because I went through male and female puberty at the same time exactly <laughs> exactly um so you know I was born female but like you know my voice was dropping tremendously so I used to sing a lot when I was a kid but you know, I, I started going through puberty and my voice was dropping a lot and I was growing facial hair and, you know, body hair as somebody who was born female, which is really, really confusing for me as a kid. Um, and also in middle school, kids are so mean. 
Um, but you know, I, I used to sing a lot and then I stopped singing because I was like, I feel terrible in my body. My voice is changing. I don't like this, you know, and all of a sudden the stuff that I used to be able to sing, I wasn't able to sing anymore. Um, which hurt a lot. And then, you know, for a while I didn't sing because I was like, oh, I sound too feminine, you know, cause I was identifying as a man at the time, you know? And I was like, oh, I sound too feminine. Like I can't do this. Like my voice is like, you know, really weird. And I remember, you know, back in high school, I tried out for, you know, our, our spring musical, which was Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella. And, you know, I got a call back for Lord Pinkleton and, you know, Lord Pingleton sings like these crazy high notes in this song. And I was the only guy that was able to reach these high notes. So it ended up, my voice ended up being my strength. And then I really, I truly found out from there, like, you know, all of these, you know, things that I thought were bad in my life actually ended up being my strength and ended up being, you know, something that I could work with. And then from there on, you know, I was like, I am unique. You know, I'm, you know, I'm singular. I have to keep going with this, you know, and so many people saw themselves represented in me that I just had to keep going, you know. What was the final Broadway show like for you as a actor? And then the show goes dormant and then you get the call a few weeks later, that they're reviving it for a Broadway reunion concert. What were those two experiences like for you? Yeah, so like when the Broadway run ended, we were just like, this is not the end. Like, there's gonna be, there's gonna be something else. Like, they're they're already planning stuff. Um. And, you know, it was like, a, it was a few months before we got the call for the Broadway reunion concert. Um, but when, like, we always knew that there was like something, like something was going to happen. Like, and then we got the email about that and we we're like, oh, there it is. There it is. There, there's what we were, you know, talking about. So, you know, it was, it was fun, you know. It also, it was really nice to see everybody again and have like the original cast back and being able to like, you know, be with everybody. You talked to Liam a lot uh, during the after, after the reunion show, and it would like I was the only one in that room. Uh, he would laser focus on me. But why do you think that there is so so many misconceptions surrounding autism and autistic people that they're not social, not funny, uh, egotistical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, savant. You are savant yeah. because naturally, except no, it's not natural at all. It's a misconception. But they persist even to this day. Why do you think that is? It's a big I, question. Yeah, I think it comes from neurotypical people and non-disabled people, uh, particularly. Um, you know, I feel like, especially when it comes to not casting authentically and having, you know, neurotypical actors play autistic characters, there's a lot of misconceptions that come through with it, you know, trying to act autistic. And I feel like that's where a lot of the misconceptions come from, you know? Yeah. So if there are any inspiring actors or advocates listening or watching this 
I almost called the performance. The episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been doing this quite a while. That's <laughs> the first and hopefully only time I screw up. There. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, if there are... If any aspiring actors or advocates are watching this episode or listening to it and want to get into acting or self-advocacy as someone who got thrust into the spotlight, right out of high school or when you were still in high school, what would be some action steps that you would provide? Yeah, I would tell people, like, be yourself. Like, do not let other people change you. And also, do not listen to the haters because there are, people are going to hate you no matter what. Like, that's just something that, like, I knew from a very young age, that people were going to hate me no matter what. Like, but if they were going to hate me, I might as well be happy while they hate me. You know what I mean? I'd rather them, like, you know, they were going to, like, people are going to hate me no matter what. Like, I might as well, like, look fly while I'm doing it, you know? Like, yeah. I might as well, like, be myself, you know, give them a reason to hate me, you know, like, whatever, like, you know. But also, it's okay not to know what you need in the moment. Because everybody talks about self-advocacy, but there's also times when, like, you don't know what you need. Like, you don't know what you need in the moment. Exactly. And that's okay. That is okay. Yeah. And so, I hope that it's only the first interview or performance we do uh, together, because I've had... Uh, Glad uh, talking to you, sharing Thank you. the Me too. Scenes, stories, wrapping up the we've talked about a lot of topics in this episode. I'd like to think that advocates with disabilities and those who have yet to discover or embrace their own disabilities, both listen and watch this show. But I'm not naive to think that either group takes away the same thing. So as my guests, what do you hope that advocates with disabilities take away from this episode? And what do you hope that people who have yet to discover or embrace their own disabilities take away from this episode? Yeah, I hope people take away that like things happen on your own timeline, you know? You don't know, you don't owe anyone anything. Things happen on your own timeline. Take your time. Be gentle with yourself. You know, it takes a lot of self-love to get to like, you know, the point of advocacy to the point of, you know, where a lot of people might be at the moment. Um, but even then, everybody's fighting a journey that nobody knows anything about. Um so you have to be gentle with yourself. Be kind to yourself throughout this journey. If someone wants to follow your career or maybe get in touch with you through your agent, how would they do that? Where are you? Uh, I am on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is at the dot dev dot Edwards. Um, you can just look up Desmond Lewis Edwards. I I'm sure I might pop up. 
Um, I also have an art account on Instagram. It's called Des E Art. Um, you'll be able to find me through there. I'm on TikTok. Um, I'm also on Tumblr. Um, I'm at oh. Wakanda Never on Tumblr. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another episode. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Laughing his face. I want to thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For uh, giving so much life to Remy and thank for you. The rest of the catch. And I look forward to seeing you on stage again hopefully very soon thank you take care all right bye